Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Refractories, Specialized Ceramic Products and Vitreous Enamel. In last two classes, we had discussed uh, several aspects about uh, ceramic industries, right? So, in this ceramic industries, you know, applications after some introduction, etc. Uh, then uh, what are the raw materials? In general, we have for uh, ceramic industries, we have seen several raw materials common, uh, out of which three are very common in almost every uh, ceramic uh, product uh, making, that is, you know, uh, clay, feldspar, and then sand or flint. In addition to this, we know that several types of uh, fluxes and then refractories are also uh, used. So, and then what we understand that, you know, most of these uh, raw materials that we use for ceramic products making, all of them are uh, oxides, you know, inorganic oxides in general, most of them, in, in fact, almost all of them, okay. So, uh, the fluxes are used for, uh, you know, reducing the uh, reaction temperature or uh, vitrification temperature, if you wanted to reduce for that purpose it is required. It is also uh, used for, you know, uh, bonding in order to make the materials or particles of the mixture to be binded together. So, you need some kind of fluxes. So, these fluxes are used for that purpose also, whereas the refractories are used for the thermostability, etc. Then we have also seen the uh, ceramic chemistry basic uh, ceramic chemistry here, so especially, you know, how this uh, kaolinite, etc., are, you know, being reacted to produce mullite, etc., these kind of things, you know, uh, we have seen. So, the mullite is one of the important refractory. So, we have also seen the uh, phase uh, diagram of uh, Al2O3 SiO2 mixture and then from here we found that, you know, mullite is forming even at moderately lower temperature as well, like 800, 900 degree centigrade by varying the composition between 10 to 75 percent, something like that, those things we have seen. And then this uh, has led to the development of, uh, you know, mullite, which is, you know, uh, has taken refractory industry to the different level, higher level, okay. Then after that, uh, we discussed uh, different types of ceramic products depending on the degree of uh, vitrification and another property. So, then where uh, we have seen different types of products possible like, you know, whiteware, then structural clay products, then uh, refractories, then special clay products, and then vitreous enamel, etc. These kind of different types of uh, ceramic products are possible. These are the classification of products, etc. Those things we have seen. Out of which we have seen the manufacturing process of this white wares as well as the structural clay products through proper flow chart, etc. In the previous lecture. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about the remaining types of ceramic products. Like we also had something like, you know, uh, ceramic uh, composites, etc., those things also we are going to see now. So, in this lecture, let us start with discussions on refractories. Refractories by chemical nature, they can be acid, they can be basic or they can be neutral refractories as well. So, these refractories and uh, super refractories are made up of materials that uh, withstand obviously what you understand like, you know, thermal stability and then chemical stability and then mechanical stability are important in any of the refractories uh, that we have already seen. So, uh, they should uh, have or uh, they should withstand thermal, chemical and physical effects required within the furnace procedures because what we have seen this uh, refractories primarily, uh, you know, uh, used in making of uh, these furnaces, right. These furnaces are usually, you know, operated at very high temperature above 1000 degree centigrade and sometime up to 2000 degree centigrade also. One example we have seen, uh, you know, uh, checker work 
refractories, etc., in glass making industries or glass making when we are discussing, we have seen such kind of you know furnaces where these refractories were used. So, in these furnaces, different types of raw materials are taken and they are you know melted by applying the heat and then that heat is often uh, started supplying by you know uh, fuel gases. When these fuel gases burn within the presence of oxygen, so then what happen? Different types of fuel gases may also possible to uh, be produced, right? So, along with that one some slags may also be produced and then uh, products may be in the you know molten conditions. Because of that one you know what you have? You have the high temperature and then different types of chemical natures etc. are there. And then you know load is also one essential thing because this glass making mostly it is done in batches, right? So load, how much load are you giving? So you know mechanical strength is also required. So all these things are in general required to be maintained in furnace. So what you expect these refractories are super refractories made up of materials. So that materials you know they should have a, you know thermal, chemical, and mechanical stability. Such refractories are available in the form of fire brick, silica, magnesite, chromite or combined magnesite, chromite bricks, silicon carbide and zirconia refractories, aluminum silicate and alumina products etc. Generally fluxes are required to bind together the particles of refractories. The purpose of the fluxes we have already seen. So, these fluxes also inorganic oxides, but uh, they reduce the vitrification temperature as well as the reaction temperature plus they get fused even at 900 or 1000 degrees centigrade itself. So, that is just moderately high temperature only not high temperature with respect to the ceramic industries, right? So, at such uh, moderate temperatures itself they are fusing. So, when they uh, fuse, so then what they do? They try to keep the materials compacted together, packed together, okay? For that uh, purpose, you know, these fluxes are used. But, you know, in refractories you do not want any kind of uh, vitrification, right? So, but binding is required. For that definitely you need to use the fluxes. But if you use abundant amount of fluxes and then you operate at very high temperature like, you know, more than 15 or 1600 degrees centigrade, then a complete vitrification takes place. Right? But these uh, refractories are used in making uh, furnace uh, construction purpose. So, in such cases vitrification is not required. Indeed, that is not going to be useful also. That is going to be detrimental effect. So, vitrification has to be reduced. How you reduce then? You cannot have a, a refractories without fluxes. Why? Because fluxes, you know, they keep particles binding together, right? So, but if you use uh, too much of fluxes, then vitrification is taking place. So, that is the reason these fluxes are taken at minimum amount, minimum weightage, they are supplied, okay? They are supplied only in uh, at minimum uh, weightage to reduce the vitrification. There are also cases of single component ceramic refractories, something like uh, pure oxide refractories. They uh, possess superior qualities. Obviously, pure individual components, you know, they will have a superior uh, properties of their own, right? So, you know, whatever the pure oxides or in a inorganic oxides if you take, you know, they have a better properties. If you mix with them with some other property of lower quality, so then you may get a product of a intermediate quality. But if you take a pure oxide of a, a better quality as a single component to make the single component refractory, so then obviously the refractory is going to have such superior qualities as individual inorganic oxides that they possess. These are made from single bodies without any clay, without any natural plasticity as well, right? And then good thing that, you know, these they bind together, they bind together amongst themselves without any uh, need of fluxes because fluxes are also inorganic, inorganic oxides and then these uh, single component ceramic uh, refractories are also mostly inorganic oxide components. So, such components are only used as a kind of uh, making for single component refractories. So, then separately you do not need fluxing agents to keep particles together. These are monocrystalline and self bonded as compared with conventional vitreous bonded or the chemical reacted bonded refractories. Now, what do you see kind of important thing any refractory that you are going to be produced? So, following points are important to consider prior manufacturing of a, a refractory. What are the materials to be processed? Let us say if you are making a furnace using a refractory and then you are using 
acidic refractories for construction of furnace. And then in that furnace if you are using alkaline materials to be handled, so that is not advisable. So what kind of materials to be processed in the furnace for which you are making a refractory or manufacturing refractory is very essential. Okay? Then working temperature of furnace where refractory is needed. Let us say you are constructing a furnace and then you are aim to operate at 1800 degrees centigrade something like that. But you are constructing refractory which fuses at 1200 or 1300 degrees centigrade itself so that is not going to work. So working temperature of furnace where refractory is needed that is also very essential point. Okay? Then rate of change of temperature, this is very much essential. Because some materials, you know, thermal expansion coefficients are such a way that if you do rapid heating or rapid cooling, then some kind of fracturing within the refractories may take place. So, such kind of fracturing or flaking of refractory should not take place. So, for that, you know, you need to consider rate of change of temperature for making refractories. How you decide it? Let us say you are making a glass in a furnace that we have already seen. So, at what heating rate are you melting the uh, raw materials, at what temperature are you uh, melting the raw materials and then at what temperature are you cooling them down, all these things are important. So the rate of change of temperature is also essential otherwise fracturing or flaking of refractories may take place. Okay? Then load applied during the heats, for example most of the furnaces that are used for the chemical plants are batch wise. Right? So, how much load are you giving? Accordingly, the strength of the uh, refractory should be decided. So, for that, you know, this load applied is also very essential characteristic. And then load, not in the cooling condition, not in the normal condition, but the during the operating conditions or whatever the 1500 or 1600 or 2000 degrees centigrade, so are you supplying the energy to the furnace for your process to occur. So, at those conditions what should be the load applied because at such conditions these raw materials may be in a melted conditions and then their densities, uh, viscosities of those materials after melting may be very different compared to their densities and viscosities when they were taken as a raw materials at atmospheric conditions. So, load applied during the heats is very essential. Then chemical reactions to be occurring, what kind of chemical reactions are occurring? So, this is both towards the product that you are going to make uh, in furnace, obviously that is one and an another one is that uh, reaction of a refractory with uh, uh, slags or uh, fuel gases or you know products etc such kind of reactions may also be occurring sometimes. So that is again very essential. So actually you should select a refractory such that it should not undergo any kind of reaction either with the slags or fuel gases or the products that are formed in the furnace. Okay? If at all they are not avoidable, uh, then what are those reactions? How to handle them? Those kind of things you have to worry about. Then. Obviously, now you see so many types of uh, characteristics are there. All you expect to have all these characteristics in one type of refractory is not going to be possible. Even if it is going to possible uh, technically, but economically it may not be possible. That is the reason any furnace you take, it is not one single type of refractory that is used for the construction of uh, furnaces, but rather you know different types of refractories are used for construction of any furnace that you are operating. Right? Now that is the reason you know so many properties are essential to note while manufacturing of our refractories. It is very essential to understand the properties of our refractories, those things we are going to see. Properties in the sense physical properties as well as the chemical properties right? or you know during the chemical reaction what is happening, all those things we have to see now. So properties of refractories. Many physical and chemical properties are essential in selection of a refractory for construction of any furnace and are discussed below. What do you mean by physical and chemical properties? Let us say you have a something like a acid or base or neutral uh, kind of refractory, which one should you use? How is it going to interact with the uh, products, slags? or fuel gases, etc. within the furnace, so those things should also be considered. So that is what it mean by chemical properties. Then what do you mean by physical properties? 
physical properties in the sense what is the uh, porosity, what is the strength, what is the heat capacity, what is the uh, conductivity, etc. These kind of things also you need to check in before uh, you know making a decision about a given type of refractory needed for the construction of a given type of furnace with a certain applications. Okay? So, let us start with chemical properties. Commercial refractory is classified into acid, basic and neutral groups though in many cases sharp distinction is not possible. Why sharp distinction is not possible whether a given refractory is acidic or basic or neutral? Because they are made up of several components, composed of several components or compounds. Right. So, that is the reason you know you cannot say it is completely acidic or basic something like that. For example, silica bricks are confirmedly acid refractories. Okay. Likewise, magnesite bricks strongly basic refractories, but if you take fire clay bricks are commonly grouped as a neutral refractories, but these may belong to either of acid or basic group depending on the relative content of silica and alumina. If it is having more silica, more than 60 percent of uh, silica, then you can say this is uh, acid refractory kind of thing. If it is having less than 30 percent of silica, then you can say you know it is more like a basic kind of thing. If it is order of uh, 40 to 60 percent uh, silica and an alumina combined, then you can say this is a kind of neutral brick kind of thing. That is the reason sharp distinction is not possible for a given refractory whether it is acid or basic or neutral because these refractories are not made up of single component but they are made up of uh, multiple components. And then one example of silica alumina is shown here. Okay? So, further it is inadvisable to use acid brick in contact with alkaline product or vice versa. If you are to handle alkaline products in a furnace then that furnace should not be constructed with the acid brick. Okay. Both chemical reaction and physical properties should be the criteria to decide selection of a refractory but not any one of these two because you know now you see chemical nature so many issues are there. When physical nature it is coming about strength, porosity, heat capacity, conductivity, etc. all those things you know so many properties are there. So, when you decide to design a refractory for a given furnace construction, so then you should construct not only the physical properties but also chemical properties. So, chemical properties we have seen now we will be seeing the physical properties also. Now, as I mentioned the sources of chemical reactions in furnace may be due to contact with slags, fuel ashes and furnace gases in addition to contact with products such as glass or steel that are being produced in furnace and then furnace is made up of this refractory. So, then all these possible reactions are possible. So, this chemical reaction does not mean that you know about the chemical nature of the refractory alone. How is it in contact with the slags, fuel ashes and furnace gases? Also like you know products like glass or steel etc. that are produced in furnace, all of them are coming into the picture. How these are interacting with the refractory materials in a chemical way that is essential here. Okay? So, all these things should also be considered. Now, we talk about the physical properties, porosity. Porosity is very uh, essential part of the refractory. Why it is very essential part of the refractory? Because any refractory that you are making you are going to take a, a 2, 3, 4, 5 or materials depending on the type of refractory you are making. Some of the refractories may be having dozens of raw materials, maybe one or two may be predominant and remaining of them may be little components, small amounts may be there. Right? But there may be. So, when you mix together there should be some kind of plasticity so that to combine the particles binded together. So, for that purpose you know sometimes you use water to improve the workability or plasticity and then you mold them in a pressing molds and then you get a brick out of which, out of which after mixing these raw materials, water etc. you have a workable moldable uh, slurry or mixture that you taking in a molding casings and then you are getting a brickware, wet brickware out of this one. Now, so much of water is there and then when you dry this brick, this water will be evaporated, dehydration will be taking place. When this water is being uh, removed by the dehydration, they will leave porous structure in the refractory and then lot of porous structure if it is there in the brick, then what happen? 
uh, and then such bricks if you are using for the construction of furnace and then during the reaction let us say glass you are making in that furnace and then a refractory is so much porous right. Then what happens the furnace gases and some amount of slags etc may also be you know going into the porous structure of the refractories. So, once these gases and then other foreign materials getting into the porous structure or interstitial spaces of the refractories then uh, the strength of those refractories would gradually decrease and then life of the furnace would be very less. Okay? So, for construction of any furnace you need to have a denser or least porous uh, you know refractories are required. If you are using refractories for insulation purpose then there you can have a porous uh, refractories. But furnace construction if you are using refractories then this refractories must be non-porous or least porous. Porosity directly related to many other physical properties of brick that including resistance to the chemical attack, strength etc. Higher the porosity of brick more easily it is penetrated by the molten fluxes and gases once these are uh, getting penetrated into the porous structure of the brick or refractory, the strength of the uh, refractory is going to decrease gradually and then life of the furnace will substantially decrease. Thus, for greater strength, thermal conductivity and heat capacity, a group of bricks with lowest porosity should be selected. Okay? Next is the fusion points. Fusion is important so that to keep particles together, but that fusion should not occur during the operation. During the operation in the sense after constructing the furnace and then some uh, product is uh, being manufactured in the furnace, glass or steel. And during the manufacturing of uh, those glass and steel kind of products in the furnace, these refractories should not undergo fusion. Okay? So, fusion points found by use of pyrometric cones of predetermined softening points. Commercial refractories soften gradually over a wide range and do not have a sharp uh, melting point that is one way good. This is because these are composed of several different materials both amorphous and crystalline. Next is the spalling. Spalling is nothing but you know when you uh, make a refractory or a brick which is a porous and then uh, when you allow it to affected by a rapid heating or rapid cooling and then that also at high temperature heating uh, up to 1500 or 1600 degrees centigrade and then heating at a very rapid pace. And then once the product has formed you know cooling it at the rapid pace if you do then what happens if the uh, brick or refractory is not uh, very dense enough then what happens internal fractures may take place inside the refractories or flaking of the refractories may also take place. Such kind of fracturing or flaking of because of the rapid heating or cooling whatever occurs is known as the spalling. It is fracturing or flaking of a refractory brick. It is due to uneven heat stresses or compression caused by heat. On heating refractories often expand and bricks that undergo greatest expansion at least uniform rate are the most susceptible to spalling. Okay? So, then you should have a construction material for the refractory which is having low thermal expansion coefficients. Such susceptibility should be evaluated when subjected to rapid heating and rapid cooling. Next one is the strength. Cold strength usually has only a slight bearing on strength at high temperatures. Resistant to abrasion or erosion is also important for many furnace constructions. Examples include byproduct coke oven walls and linings of discharge end of rotary cement kiln etc. Now, resistance to temperature changes is another important physical property because temperature changes that is the heating rate how rapidly temperature is changing while heating or while cooling is very much essential. And the material should have resistance to such kind of temperature changes otherwise spalling may take place. Bricks with lowest thermal expansion and coarsest texture are most resistant to rapid thermal changes. Right? So, you should as I mentioned already you should have a material which is having lowest thermal expansion so that to make uh, bricks also or refractories also with lowest thermal expansion. And then coarsest texture also another important thing is the porosity. Least porosity is also the one which provide the, uh, resistance to rapid thermal changes. Such bricks develop less strain on rapid thermal changes. Bricks that have been used for long time are often melted to 
glassy slags on outside surface are even more or less corroded away anyway. Thermal conductivity is not that important, however, densest and least porous bricks have highest thermal conductivity. Okay? But in the case of uh, some uh, furnaces, furnace construction like uh, muffle furnaces, then thermal conductivity is also very important to consider. Insulation is desired in special refractories only, not for all. Now, the last important physical property of uh, refractories is heat capacity. Furnace heat capacity depends upon thermal conductivity, specific heat and specific gravity of refractory. Low quantity of heat absorbed by lightweight brick works as an advantage when furnaces are operated intermittently because the working temperature of furnace can be obtained in less time with uh, less fuel. Thus, dense and then heavy fire clay brick are best for regenerator checker work refractories. Such refractories have been used for making uh, generators which are used for coke ovens, glass furnaces and stove for blast furnaces, steel making etc. for those purposes. In fact, such checker work uh, regenerator we have seen in glass furnaces while discussing about glass industry. Now, we talk about manufacture of refractories. Physical operations and chemical conversions used in refractories manufacture are uh, listed here. Most of them are common with any of the ceramic industries like something like you know grinding and size reduction, screening, mixing, pressing or molding and repressing, drying and finally burning or vitrification or firing. So, what do you expect to have the most important property in the refractories as per the uh, physical and chemical properties that we have seen is the high bulk density. If you have high bulk density, most of the other physical properties are you know uh, naturally maintained. Okay? So, because bulk density affects many other important properties such as strength, volume stability, slag and spalling, resistance, heat capacity, etc. For insulating refractories anyway, a porous structure is required that is low density uh, material you can use. But for the furnaces definitely you look at it high bulk density refractories. So, we see individual steps of uh, uh, refractory making. Let us start with the grinding. Grinding is nothing but size reduction of the particles so that you need to have a specialized or required size of the particles in the mixture. It has been found that you know if you have coarse and then fine particles in the ratio of uh, 55 to 45, that is going to give a densest mixture. Right? So, you have to do the size reduction such a way that you get 55 percent of the material should be having coarse size and then 45 percent of the material having the fine size approximately. Okay? And then few uh, intermediate particles are anyway unavoidable. Why this ratio? Because if you have coarsest particles, so the interstitial spaces are bigger. So, in those interstitial spaces uh, or the void spaces, the final particles will go and then stick there. So, then occupy those interstitial spaces forming because of the coarse particles. So, then what happens? Because of that one, you know, uh, density or the void space in decreases. So, what happens because of uh, such occupying of fine particles in the interstitial spaces between the coarse particles that will reduce the void space. If the void space is reduced then obviously density would be higher. Thus careful screening, separation and recycling are necessary for close control. Next one is the mixing. Mixing usually is done to mix the uh, raw materials along with the water, little bit of water so that to have a required plasticity or workable conditions of the mixture. So, real function of uh, mixing is distribution of plastic materials so as to coat thoroughly the non-plastic constituents. This serves the purpose of providing a lubricant during the molding operation and permits bonding of mass with a minimum number of voids. Next step in the manufacturing is the molding. Great demand for refractory bricks of greater density, higher density that is strength, volume and then uniformity has resulted in adaptation of dry press method of molding. Because you know if the slurry which is you know mixture of uh, raw materials after size reduction etc. and then water, you take it and then if it is very wet then and then dry it, 
by open drying or other kind of drying methods whatever we have seen. So, this water gets dehydrated and then removed while the drying process, but they leave void spaces. So, leave the void spaces. These void spaces, you know, if uh, they may be up to 30 to 40 percent as per our uh, fluid mechanic uh, studies related understanding, right. So, if such percentage of voids are there, so then you cannot have a uh, dense brick. So, that is the reason people started a uh, new method, dry press method, where only nominal amount of water is only used for the you know mixing purpose and then only dry pressing is been done. It is a mechanically operated press and shown in the flow chart in the next slide we are going to see. Dry press is suited particularly for batches that consist of non-plastic materials, okay. Now this is the flow chart. The crude clay mixtures whatever clay 1, clay 2, etc. are required for refractory materials, they are taken in hollows or silos, then they have been grinded using dry pan grinders, so that to get a particles of size 55 to 45, you know, coarse to fine particles and then such particles you separate out using the screen, if at all oversized particles are there, you take back to grinding section, okay. Whereas, the uh, particles of desired section, they are taken to product particles storage. These are not the product, final product. In size reduction uh, screening methods, whatever the final particles of specified uh, size as per the requirement are there, they are also called as a product. So, that product particles are taken or the product clays are taken in uh, separate, uh, you know, containers in silos or hap or something like that. Then they will be you know mixed together along with some amount of water and then wet mixing would be done so that a slurry can be made. Slurry, it is not, it should not be slurry, it is a kind of you know wet mixture, just a wet mixture and then that is taken to a storage and then that mixture is undergoes a dry pressing method to get a formed wear. This will be further fired to get a refractory. So, this is the dry pressing method dry pressing of brick or refractories, okay. Now, we see remaining steps of this uh, refractory manufacturing. In order to use high pressure forming, it is necessary to de-air. Actually, you know, the A's whatever are forming because of using little amount of water, that is also should be removed. Actually, uh, whatever the wet mixture that you are taking, so in that one, you know, uh, when pressing is done, so still some kind of voids may be formed and then those voids may be occupied by the air. So, those air gaps are you know voids occupied by the air you know should be provided in the depressing section itself uh, and provision to remove that air as well. That can be done by the vacuuming. So, that when you do the dry pressing along with the vacuum provision, so then you get a product or you know brickware which is having as much denser as possible. This de-airing also helps in avoid laminations and cracking when pressure is released, okay. So, when pressure is applied, the gas is absorbed by the clay or condensed. Vacuum is applied through vents in the mold box or in the uh, dry pressing boxes that we have seen. Large special shapes are not easily adapted to machine molding in general. So, next step is drying. It is used to remove the moisture added before molding to develop plasticity, okay. Elimination of water leaves voids as mentioned and causes high shrinkage and internal stains. So, in order to avoid this one, repressing is done sometimes, right. In some cases, drying is omitted entirely and the small amount necessary accomplished during the heating stage of fire cycle or otherwise repressing is also done as per the requirement. Last step of manufacturing of uh, refractories is burning. Here it may be carried out in typical around downdraft kilns or continuous tunnel kilns as well. Two important things take place during the burning are development of permanent bond by partial vitrification, okay. Vitrification is cannot be avoided because there are fluxes, but we had made sure that these fluxes are in minimum amount. So, partial vitrification is taking place and then that cannot be avoided. 
development of stable mineral forms for future services something like you know uh, mullite formation etc those things we have seen in phase diagram of alumina and silica changes that take place are removal of water of dehydration followed by calcination of carbonates and then oxidation of ferrous iron these are the common steps any of the ceramics production as we have already seen in previous lectures also during these changes volume may shrink as much as 30 percent and severe strains are set up in the refractories okay shrinkage may be eliminated by pre stabilization of materials used so whatever the raw materials that you are taking you do a kind of pre stabilization of such materials before making this wet mixture and then before uh, go undergoing this uh, dry pressing steps etc okay now uh, we have seen the manufacturing of uh, refractories also after uh, discussing about their properties now we'll see varieties of refractories more than 95 percent of refractories manufactured are non-basic that is majorly acidic and neutral bricks are predominant as refractories okay refractory is usually thought of in terms of uh, thermal stability and heat is the sole agent that affects the final destruction if at all occurring but that is not true it is the chemical reaction chemical reaction between refractories and then uh, slags, glass slags or uh, steel slags etc or uh, the furnace gases, furnace ashes etc with those whatever the reactions and this refractories are undergoing they are the main cause of any destruction of a refractories in the furnaces but not the heat, not because of heating at high temperatures. Okay? Some of the refractories include are you know fire clay brick, silica brick, high alumina refractories, basic refractories magnesite refractories, insulating bricks, silicon carbide bricks, refractories from crystalline alumina or alumina silicates, electrocast or core heart uh, refractories etc. So, their manufacturing etc. again uh, specific to individual you know material that is being manufactured but we are not going into the details of that one as we have seen or we are discussing uh, generalized aspects of any of the ceramic products uh, given for other cases also. So, here also a generalized approach of refractory making we have seen. We are not going into the details of a manufacture of any of the specific type of refractory. So, that is all about the uh, refractories, raw materials, properties of refractories, manufacturing of refractories and then varieties of uh, refractories. Now, we discuss about the next topic that is specialized ceramic products as the name suggests they are specialized they are designed and constructed or manufactured for specialized applications only so obviously they will not be available in large amounts or large volumes however their market value would be sufficiently high because they have been designed and then produced for a specialized applications so these specialized ceramic products may be grouped as ceramic composites ferroelectric and ferromagnetic ceramics and high alumina ceramics. We are going to discuss about each of these three types of specialized ceramic products. Let us start with ceramic composites. As the name suggests composites, ceramic composites. So, then here you have the ceramic portion is anyway there and then it is being composited by adding some other material something like metal or metal oxides. Okay? So, these may be defined as a structures of metallic honeycombs or webbings impregnated with a ceramic face. So, we have a ceramic face and then we have a metallic face and then a kind of a composites are being formed. Similar like you know if you take a polymer, individual polymer if you take it might not be having the enough strength or you know properties of desired or physical or mechanical strength, right. But if you make a composites. Uh, of polymers then obviously it has been found that their strength is better than uh, individual polymers themselves right similar concept may be we can thought of here in ceramic uh, composites also however the ceramic composites were developed well before the polymeric composites these get strength from high alloy metals because when you have impregnation so then strength may not be good but Strength may be uh, coming here in these ceramic composites because high alloy metals, these metals and then also high alloy metals are there, so then they usually have the uh, you know superior strength. These possesses good thermal properties due to ceramic forms of composites, 
temperature limits of such composites are exceedingly high. Why? Because these are made up of metals and ceramics and these metals are high alloy metals. These high alloy metals are having you know uh, thermal stability of uh, you know more than 2000 degree centigrade sometime or even higher also. Employed or developed for applications in aerospace hardware such as heat shields, rocket nozzles and ramjet chambers etc. Now, we take a uh, special type of uh, ceramic composite which is known as cermet. It is a group of ceramic composite material consisting of mixture of ceramic and metallic components usually in the form of powder. This mixture of uh, ceramic and metallic components in the form of powder whatever you have taken, they usually compacted and sintered in order to obtain certain physical properties of uh, requirement of the consumer. Such physical properties are not found in solely in either of the components, neither in ceramics nor in metallic components. If you individually take ceramics, whatever the physical properties are there and then uh, if you take individually metallic components, whatever the physical components are there, you know, then they may not be of uh, certain importance. But when you make this cermet or ceramic composite called cermet, then you get a ceramic composite which is having ex you know, unusual physical properties. Okay? These are used in linings for brakes and clutches because of greater weights and then higher speeds involved. Further also used as non-lubricating bearings in the temperature range of 370 to 815 degrees centigrade. So, any lubrication if you take and then apply at such high temperature they will be dried up. But these provide such non-lubricating bearings. You know. You definitely you need bearings and then for those you need some uh, you know lubrication, but when you use this thing you do not need any lubrications. Then how are these ceramic composites are manufactured? So obviously natural intuitiveness tell us you have to make individually ceramics, you have to make individually metals and then you have to do some kind of thermal processing to get these ceramic composites. So, but however we see step by step. So, these are obviously reaction bonded and then reaction is uh, bonding ceramic and metal composites. Okay? So, that whatever the bonding is there between the ceramic and metal composites are there, they are formed by chemical reactions. Okay? This reaction bonds two materials when heated below melting point of either of the materials. Let us say ceramic is having melting point of uh, 1200 degree centigrade and then metal is having a melting point of uh, 1800 degree centigrade. So, you have to melt them at temperature less than 1200 degree centigrade. Okay? Ceramic acts as catalyst to cause corrosion of metal then to form metal oxides. As this metal oxides forming then what happens? Crystals of oxide grow into the crystal structure of the ceramic and then forms a ceramic composite. Okay? And then this bond formation whatever is there that is not only quick but also it is extremely strong and permanent. Once the bond is formed you cannot remove two materials individually, you have to break them, destroy them. Okay? Although it forms quickly, for optimum strength two materials are usually kept hot for several hours while clamping together chemically. This clamping is not physical, it is like just like a bonding. Okay? chemical bonding. Such bonding can occur between all metals and then all ceramics. But if you wanted to have strongest bonds, it has been found that between noble metals and then oxide ceramics, you can get the strongest bonds. Noble metals such as platinum, gold and silver, oxide ceramics such as alumina, magnesia, silica, zirconia and beryllia, they provide strongest bonding it has been found like that. However, you can take any metal, any ceramic oxide right? and then you can uh, make a ceramic composite that is possible. But the bond has to be strong and then strength has to be higher, so then you have to opt for such kind of material. Okay? And then these are produced in small quantities, small numbers because they are specialized ceramic products, ceramic composites, so then they are developed for specialized application only. So, even if you are using you know noble metal like uh, platinum, gold, etc., it is not going to be affecting economically because you are getting money back because they are developed or designed and then constructed for the specialized application purposes. We see what are those applications. 
gold coated ceramic wafers for semiconductor chips, then zirconia lined steel for corrosion resistant uses especially for uh, chemical plants, then ceramic capped gold dental crowns etc. Such chemical bonding also works well with gemstones. You might have seen several gold ornament with gems, right? So, these gemstones are you know made as a composite along with the gold, okay? So, such kind of you know chemical bonding happens between these gemstones and then gold as well. They will be providing a permanent bond between gold setting and then gemstone and then you have a proper ornament and then you cannot remove them they will not be detached at any time. It may be for years or decades. Uh, if at all you have to recover the gold from the gemstone, then you have to melt it and then recover it. it. Such strong and permanent is the bond between these metals and ceramics. Several materials can be blown or drawn into fibers form which are especially useful for high temperature insulation. We can see that you know these are formed in a small, small quantity, small, small sizes. One or two examples we see now. Here. Composite produced without any bonding agents are composite of blown micro quartz fiber having just diameter 1, 2, 3 microns only. Similarly, alumino borosilicate fiber having 1 to 11 micron diameter and then length you see only less than 30 mm. Okay? Such composites save fuels also up to 30 percent of fuel saving is done if at all if you let us say if you take a zirconia line steel for corrosion resistant such equipments uh, you know in chemical plants if you use. So, then you know uh, it uh, saves fuels also for example, blankets or modules of ceramic fibers for heat treating insulation for porcelain enameling furnaces and then ceramic kiln boilers etc. So, if you have such kind of composite material for construction of this equipment you can save the fuel up to 30 percent. So, this is all about ceramic composites. Now, we go to the second category of this specialized uh, clay products that is ferroelectric and ferromagnetic ceramics. Obviously, you can see ferroelectric and then ferromagnetic the title. So, then that means they are going to have or they must have been found at having great applications in electric uh, designs equipment. Okay? So, barium titanate is the most common composite in this category because whatever the making of titanium and its components, uh, you know it is going to have unusual properties that are extremely useful in electrical applications. Whatever the titania and its components there, they exhibit unusual properties. We may not be knowing from electrical engineering point of view, but it has been found that these unusual properties are extremely useful in electrical applications. For that reason, these ceramic products or ceramic composites are placed in specialized ceramic products. Processes used in fabricating titania and titanate bodies are ceramic in character. Ferromagnetic ceramic materials are responsible for most important advances in design of electrical equipment. These are used in TV sets, computers, magnetic switches, wideband transformers, recorders and memory devices, etc. Now, you see how much important are these applications and these, you know, they are not produced in uh, tons and tons, they are produced in small quantities, but their application you see very much essential in uh, present days context view point of view. In present days context point of view, these are very much uh, important applications. Okay? Last category of this uh, specialized ceramic products is high alumina ceramics. High alumina in the sense, alumina is present in the high quantities, but how much is high? More than 85 percent, you know, um, by weight if you have in the ceramics, so then that refractory whatever or that ceramic product whatever you are having that you can call it as high alumina ceramics. These are mechanically strong and dense materials unlike refractories which are usually porous. Most high alumina ceramics are used to take advantage of uh, their resistance. Actually advantage of this uh, high alumina ceramics are you know not their uh, resistance to the high temperature, but their wear resistance, their uh, resistance towards the corrosion and then dimensional stability. In all three dimensions they almost remain stable at the applied temperatures or at the operating conditions. Okay? So, they do have high thermal resistance, but these are known for the other properties because other ceramics etc. may be having the thermal resistance much better than this high alumina ceramics. 
but these high alumina ceramics are good at other properties like wear resistance, corrosion resistance and dimensional stability. Uses include linings for mining clutches and slides, insulators for electrostatic precipitators, respirator walls and precision machine components etc. So, this is all about the uh, specialized ceramic products. Now, the last topics of ceramic industry that we are going to discuss is vitreous enamel. When the name indicate vitreous that means fluxes would definitely be there and then vitrification must be taking place. Okay? So, we have to see how much important vitrification is required and then how this enameling is being done those things we are going to discuss. It is a ceramic mixture containing a large portion of fluxes applied cold but fused to the metal at moderate red heat temperatures. So, when you have large proportions of fluxes okay, and then heating at moderate red heat temperature that means high temperature then obviously what will happen? Vitrification takes place. High vitrification or complete vitrification may take place because if the fluxes present in the large proportions, if the fluxes are there definitely vitrification takes place. If they are present in the high proportion and then heated at very high temperature then complete vitrification definitely will take place. Okay? And then such vitreous enamel has been long valued as material of great beauty in the field of decorative art. In ancient days, enamel to gold, silver, copper is found to be you know very precious kind of material. Okay? So, that is one of the uh, oldest application you can see ancient application of this vitreous enamel. Nowadays, it is also available in general commercial use because of uh, its uh, durability and then wide applications. In addition, it is easy to clean and then it resists corrosion which is very much essential. Common uses of it in the present era includes plumbing fixtures, cooking utensils, industrial equipment and glass enameled steel for chemical use etc. Now we see what are the important steps in the manufacturing of this vitreous enamels. Raw materials are the very important steps. We understand that uh, clay, feldspar and then sand, flint etc. are anyway raw materials. But important raw materials, but in addition to that one there are some other raw materials which are specifically required for either enameling or for you know vitrification. So, those what are they we are going to discuss in the part of raw materials. Then manufacturing of frit, preparation of metal parts, then application of the enamel to the metal parts and then finally firing. So, let us start discussing about each of these 5 important steps of uh, vitreous enamel making. First one is the raw materials. Unlike for other ceramics these are vitreous enamel should have when you are doing the vitreous enamels then you know they should be fine enough, they should be high purity. Like let us say you know clay bricks you are making. So, directly from the bank you can take uh, clay and then fire it in the setup so then you get the bricks. But if you wanted to make vitreous enamels you know high purity is very much essential and then fineness is also very much essential and then suitable mineral composition is required. Composition something here and there then gone you do not get the required material that is having proper corrosion resistance etc. Okay. Proper grain shape is also required. In addition to these properties depending on the vitreous enamel that is being uh, produced there may be special other uh, physical characteristics may be there. So, all those things are important. Okay. So, raw materials used in enamel industries are divided into 6 different groups. Two groups are very common for any of the uh, ceramic uh, products. They are nothing but refractories and fluxes. In addition to these two types of materials, you also need to have opacifiers, colors, floating agents and then electrolytes. We see what are they. Refractories are same like whatever we had for other ceramic products like quartz, feldspar and clay and they contribute to acidic part of the melt and give body to the glass. Fluxes, borax, soda ash, cryolite and fluospar etc. These are the common fluxes and then they are also common for other types of ceramic products, but these are basic in nature. So, then they interact with the acidic part of refractories and then form glass. 
okay. These are also uh, tend to lower the fusion temperature of enamel as the basic characteristics of the fluxes is the reducing the reaction temperature and then keeping the particles binded together. Opacifiers, these are added to glass to give it the white opaque appearance. So, characteristics of a vitreous enamel and then two types of opacifiers are available, insoluble opacifiers like titanium dioxide, tin oxide, zirconium oxide. Now, see here zirconium oxide is also a flux, right? titanium dioxide is also used as a color. So, some of them are you know having multiple characteristics. Right? So, now titanium dioxide may be used for the color purpose as well as for the you know fluxing purpose as well as the opaque nature purpose. Whereas, the zirconium oxide they, it can also be used as a kind of uh, not only opacifier, but also for the refractive purpose. So, some of these materials having uh, more than one characteristics of requirement of a final product. Other type of uh, opacifiers are devitrification opacifiers, they are cryolites, floor spurs, they also act as fluxes which rendering enamel more fusible. Okay. Colors may be oxides, elements, salts or frits may act either as refractories or as fluxes. As I said titanium dioxide, you know it can be acted as you know color as well as you know it can be acting uh, used as fluxes also. Similarly, zirconium oxide etc. this kind of thing. Floating agents. Clay or gums are used as floating agents chosen to suspend enamel in water. Pure plastic clay is required. Electrolytes added to peptide the clay and properly suspend the enamel. Example borax, soda ash, magnesium sulphate and magnesium carbonate. See now this borax and soda ash they are also fluxes. They are also used for the electrolyte purpose as well. Okay. Now we see the next step of uh, manufacturing of vitreous enamel. First step is the raw materials that we have seen. The second step is manufacturing of frit. So, it is similar to the first stage of manufacture of ordinary glass. Ordinary glass what you do whatever the raw materials are there you take in a furnace and then you supply uh, fuel and then oxygen so that the burning of fuel takes place and then heat would be supplied to these raw materials and then these raw materials would be melted. And then this process you do for sufficiently higher time so that the melting is uniform. It should not be like that melted at some location and then other locations it may not be properly melted. No, that can happen because in the furnace your temperature may not be uniform everywhere. It may be higher at the center, at the walls it may be lower. There may be temperature gradients etc. So, in order to have a proper uniform melting of the material what you have to do? You have to allow them to uh, melt for sufficiently longer time. Okay. So, here raw materials are mixed in proper proportions and charged into a melting furnace maintained at 1370 degree centigrade for 1, 2, 3 hours. So, that batch get uniformly melted. Then allowed to pour from furnace into a quenching tank of cold water. Then shattering the melt into millions of frayable pieces and is called frit. Now, these steps whatever you know this melting all these things it is same like a glass making ordinary glass making like that only we are doing here also. Okay. Enamel is normally made in wet process by grinding the ingredients, principally mixture of frit and clay. Clay is used as a suspension aid only and then this is done in a ball mill. Mixture is then passed through a 200 mesh screen so that to see that size should not be more than 200 mesh screen. Okay. Oversize are sent back and then crushing all that process again recycling process one has to go through. Major step in process simplification is development of electrostatic powder spray application. Okay. Powder is supplied ready to use eliminating the need for implant milling etc. This technology also saves energy used to remove water in conventional wet processing. Next step of manufacturing of uh, vitreous enamel is the preparation of metal parts. How do you prepare them? Success of enameling depends on nature and uniformity of metal base to which the enamel is fused. This metal base whatever is there that has to be clean enough. If it is clean enough then only enameling can be done properly. Okay. Then second one is the obtaining parallelism between coefficient of expansion of enamel and metal. 
see the thermal expansion coefficient is very much important in any of these ceramic composites because these materials are having different uh, thermal expansion coefficients then what happens? When you apply higher temperature they may not be attached to or you know bonded together rather you know one of them may be flaking off kind of thing or shrinkage or internal strain formation may take place. That is the reason when you make a composite the material mixture whatever is there or basic constituents whatever you take they should have a thermal expansion coefficient of the same order. Okay? In cast iron enameling industry castings are frequently made in same factory in which they are enameled. Further before the liquid enamel is supplied to the metal, surface must be thoroughly cleaned off all foreign material. Then only proper uh, bonding will take place. Cleaning allow enamel coating to adhere well to metals and do not affect it itself. Sheet metal is cleaned by pickling in dilute acids at 60 degree centigrade after iron has been annealed. Advent of powder application has brought with it the pickle free metal preparation method that is only cleaning of base metal is necessary for satisfactory coating with the powder. Next step of uh, vitreous enamel manufacturing is application of enamel. Sheet iron coats are generally applied by dipping or slushing since the wear is usually coated on all slides. Slushing differs from draining in that enamel slip is thicker and must be shaken from wear. Another method of application is spraying. Enamel is air dried and colors are brushed and stenciled on. For uh, premium wear enamel is usually applied in two coats or even multiple coats as per the requirement. We have been talking about the uh, powder process what it is we will see in a few steps as well here. In this process steel is coated by electrostatic spraying. This process is evolving to a two coat one fire system consisting of thin powder base coat and a powder cover coat as well, base as well as the cover coat, two coats. And then these two coats are being fired in one single step that is the reason these are known as the two coat one fire system. Both coats are cured at once in a single fire. This produces a quality product at much lower cost than conventional processes. Final step of uh, vitreous enamel making is the firing. All enamels must be fired on the wear to melt them into a smooth continuous glassy wear not only uh, enamel any of the ceramic product that has to be properly undergo firing otherwise product will not be final. So, but however firing is a very important step one has to do it carefully. So, the following steps are very much essential to maintain in order to have a good enamel at firing stage. What are the proper firing temperature? This temperature has to be maintained 750 to 800 degree centigrade and then time also 1 to 15 minutes time proper support of the wear during the firing, uniform heating and cooling of the uh, wear otherwise you know uh, fracturing may occur. If support is not there so then uh, you know design may be destroyed, these kind of problems may be there. Then atmosphere free from the dust, if the dust etc are there those will also be joined together with the vitreous enamel and then the product will not be fine enough. These special enamel or glass lined equipment are tested by high frequency electrical testers to exclude defects in such equipment. Presently enamel coats average about 0.165 mm as compared with 0.66 mm a few years ago. You can see how much finer coats uh, we are able to do nowadays. In chemical plants special enamel or glass lined equipment are extensively used especially in uh, equipment like reactors etc. So that is all about uh, vitreous enamel manufacturing right. So with this we complete the uh, ceramic industries topic as well. The references for this lecture are provided here. However, this entire lecture is prepared from this reference book. Thank you.